come to work to get things done. Your teams are not all sat next to each other in the same physical space, so you use online collaboration tools. The problem is, there are a lot of different tools to choose from, and often teams want to use different ones from each other. I'm going to show you how you and your teams can use diverse collaboration tools, each tool bringing different strengths and morphing together as a mighty unified force. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, and you're right. It does sound a lot like the Power Rangers. That's what your organization's collaboration can be like. Costumes optional. Because although I'm going to talk about collaboration tools, the tools themselves are just a means to an end, which is to help you together achieve your goals. Here's where we're going in the next 20 minutes. We'll start by considering the relationship between your company's culture and collaboration tools. We'll then look at two mental models to help you think about tools. Then we'll zoom in on some practical ways to connect and use collaboration tools to unleash those superpowers. My name is Matt Dolan. I'm a senior product manager working on Trello Enterprise. I've been with Trello for nearly six years in engineering and product, working remotely from the UK with teams around the world. So I've relied on collaboration tools and learned, learned a lot about making them work best. Now, this session is about tools, but we're not going to start there. First and foremost, collaboration is a people thing. I find it helpful to frame tools within a broader perspective of collaboration as a people problem. Used well, great tools can give people superpowers. Used badly, tools can hinder people from collaborating and just add to the chaos. If you want your organisation to be mighty at collaborating, firstly, you're going to need to think about these people and culture needs. If they're not met, no tools will fix your problems. But if these cultural needs are met, you'll have a fantastic foundation on which to build awesome collaboration, whether your people are co-located or remote or a hybrid mix of the two. What kind of people needs am I talking about? Here are just a few examples. Trust, openness, empathy, psychological safety, candid feedback, assuming positive intent. These are just some I thought of. I'm sure you can think of others too. There's a complex relationship between your tools and these cultural values. Just as an example, take trust. If it's hard to trust people, you're going to need to lock down your tools, restricting permissions to as few people as possible. But on the flip side, if you lock down your tools so people can't make changes they need, you may be implicitly communicating that you don't trust them. With a fairly small co-located team, collaboration is generally intuitive. But when we move away from that, remote teams, people working from home, maybe in different time zones, we have to be intentional about replicating specific collabor collaboration needs and patterns via technology. We'll look at some more practical examples of these interactions between culture and tools in a few minutes, as well as some tips for replicating real life collaboration patterns via technology. There are many different tools which exist to solve different problems in different ways for different purposes and in different contexts because different businesses are different. Different teams are different. Different people are different. There is no one size fits all tool. Here are just some of the many tools available. And don't worry if you don't recognize some of them. If it helps, you'll find a list of tools in the resources included with this video. But some of the tools that are out there are Trello, Jira Software, Jira Work Management, Confluence, Notion, Asana, Monday, ClickUp, Google Docs, Sheets, Calendar, Gmail, Meet, Microsoft Teams, Planner, Office, PowerPoint, Todoist, Figma, Miro, Mural, Zoom, Webex, Slack, Loom. <sighs> so how can we think about the different tools available and how they can fit together? I've got two mental models we can use and then some practical examples for connecting tools together in a way that gives humans superpowers. Our first mental model is axes. Not those kind of axes, these kind of axes. Different tools have characteristics and strengths that make them more suitable for some things than for others. There are a load of axes you could think of, but here are five that I think are helpful. Firstly, we could think of the type of work a tool is useful for. On one end of the axis, we might have structured work. On the other end, we'd have flexible work. An example of a tool for structured work is Jira software, and for flexible work, Trello. 
What about the message you're communicating via the tool? It could be a simple objective message or a more nuanced, emotive one. Perhaps Slack is most suitable for simple messages, but for more nuanced messages, we might want to use Zoom. How about when people consume the message or the work in the tool? On one end of the axis, we have synchronous consumption, everyone together at the same time, such as on a WebEx video call. At the other end, asynchronous, where people consume it at different times, for which a recorded Loom video is great. Or not just when, but how people consume it. At one end of the axis, you have to sit down and spend a while engaging with the tool like a feast. At the other end is more like a snack, able to be consumed in bite-sized chunks. At the feast end is a YouTube video that you have to sit and watch to the end versus a snackable quick Atlassian Atlas update. Another axis could be the size of team you're collaborating with. A big team, email is good, versus a small team where a Trello board really shines. Using axes like this, we can pick the right tool for any particular job. But we know that collaboration needs also change throughout the life cycle of a project. So it may be that a piece of work needs to move from one tool to another as it progresses. Or multiple tools may be needed to cover different parts of the same project and the different collaboration needs to achieve that work. Here's one example of using different tools. Forgive the fact that it's a bit meta. It's how I produced this very talk. I started writing this talk in Trello, which I really enjoy because it forces you to break your writing into chunks on different cards and brings some lightweight structure via lists. So I created a Trello board, started throwing my ideas down and gradually developed the talk. Once it had got to a first draft state, I was able to share the board link via Slack to let some other people glance over the board and give feedback via card comments. From the Trello board, I then recorded a practice run as a Loom video adding in tone of voice and facial expression. The Loom video was more fixed than the Trello board, but more nuanced and expressive. Once the talk had matured, I moved it into Confluence and Keynote for visuals. There, it's harder to make structural changes, but they're great for others to understand it as a whole and for refining parts. Then finally, I recorded it as a video and edited it. It was then very fixed, but great for conveying what is, hopefully, a rich, engaging message with tone of voice and well-timed visuals, and it's scalable to reach a large audience. There's just one example moving between Trello, Slack, Loom, Confluence, Keynote, and to this video you're watching now, using our first mental model of axes to select the best tool for each job. Our second mental model is the hub. This one's all about the connections. In one sense, this is nothing new. It's really just hyperlinks, what the web was built on, but hyperlinks are still super powerful. Almost all cloud tools use one of the key Lego bricks of the web, the URL. URLs are such an understated yet powerful thing. They're just text and everything accepts text, yet they allow you to reference a specific item in any kind of tool, whether that's a page, an image, a video, a card, a design, a video call, a task. So linking things together isn't a problem, but there's linking things together and there's linking things together. Those of you who are a little bit geeky like me will recognize this as a patch bay it's a piece of equipment specifically designed to keep connections between tools tidy so you can follow those links and maintain a sense of order where otherwise you'd have chaos. Which sounds a bit like collaboration, doesn't it? So what's the collaboration tool equivalent of a patch bay? We need a hub to connect things together in a way that brings order to the chaos of collaboration. I'm sure you're familiar with that chaos Work spread across dozens of places, some in specialized tools that only a few of your teammates know how to use. Some just sat there in those many, many browser tabs that you have open right now. Some work needing your attention urgently, other things just for future reference. There's productivity, creativity, even beauty in there. It's just all a bit of a mess. This idea of needing a hub isn't something I've just invented. In a report published in January, Gartner used the term the new work hub to talk about their concept of the composable enterprise, allowing interchangeable technologies to be connected together for improved productivity. 
Let me show you how Trello is a super powerful hub for managing work across all those many tools. You may be familiar with a Trello board. A Trello board gives you flexibility and just enough lightweight structure to be perfect for ideation, brainstorming, and starting to get clarity on the puzzle pieces of the project. But while simple on the surface, Trello has a depth that makes it powerful as a hub. Much of this power comes from the fact that a Trello card is not necessarily one type of thing. A card is not a task. Just like the real life version, the paper sticky note or index card, a card can become so many different things. A Trello card might be an idea, it might be a picture, it might be a task, or it might represent some piece of content in another tool. There's a really powerful feature across Atlassian products called Smart Links. You paste a humble URL onto a card, Smart Links sprinkles a little fairy dust, and boom, you have a live, updated, embedded view into an item of work in another tool. It works with a link to a Confluence page, YouTube video, GitHub pull request, Asana task, Figma design, Jira issue, Google doc. Each becomes a smart link where I can see the live status of that work, preview it in place, and even edit it without leaving the Trello board. Because smart links work not only with Atlassian products, even if some of your teams use Asana, some use Monday, some use Trello or Jira, all those tools can be plugged into the one Trello hub. As, a, as an example of using Trello as a hub, recently my team started a new, new project. We created a Trello board and outlined the big chunks of work needed for the project, gradually breaking those down into smaller pieces. From there, different people on the team went and started work in whichever tool was most suitable. Confluence for a technical specification, Figma for designs, Jira software for development tasks. Each of those pieces were linked to from that Trello board, like spokes going out from the hub. But all that spread out content was visible and available for everyone from the hub board. Even Slack conversations and Zoom recordings could be added to keep everything in one place, even while it's in many different places. So that's Trello as a hub for managing your team's work, regardless of which tools the work is happening in. We've thought about the relationship between company, culture, and collaboration tools. We've looked at axes for choosing the best tool for the job and the need for a hub to bring connective order to the chaos. Now, let's look at some practical ways to set up and connect tools to unleash your team's collaboration superpowers. We'll consider four areas, trust and teamwork, emotional communication, time and focus, and clarity and expectations. Firstly, how can you foster trust and empower incredible teamwork? Recall, if you will, back in the day when your team was routinely together in the same time in the same building. Unless it was especially sensitive, I imagine you'd discuss work with teammates where other people would be able to overhear, perhaps in an open plan office. That gave people passive awareness of what was going on. It fosters collaboration and allows everyone an opportunity to bring value to the work, even from unexpected sources. In a remote or hybrid world, we can replicate that trust and passive awareness in our tools with a principle called open by default. What does that mean? As an example, if you're using Slack, default to discussing work in open channels rather than in private messages. That allows people to overhear for awareness and potentially to provide unexpected valuable input. Unless you need to restrict it, allow your documents to be accessible by anyone in your company. Confluence allows this, as does Trello, where you can set a board or workspace as visible to anyone in your company. Definitely lock down access where you need to, but only if you need to. Giving people access to information and welcoming input communicates that you trust them, and that trust will empower great things. As an example, Think about Amazon Prime. As you may be aware, the initial idea for Prime came from an unexpected source, from a software engineer called Charlie Ward via a suggestion box. You see, if you trust your whole team to give their input and keep your tools open by default to everyone in your company, you make people feel empowered to make changes to radically improve things. That doesn't mean you lose control completely. Audit logs that show who changed what and the ability to revert changes mean it's low risk to keep settings more open. 
In an office, there might be a whiteboard on the wall. Anyone in the room could pick up a pen and make damaging changes to notes up on that whiteboard. But generally they don't, do they? Next then, rich emotional communication. Something that separates humans, like me and I'm assuming you, from robots is that we have emotions. And that's a good thing. If you're collaborating in a low emotional bandwidth tool and things get heated, switch to a tool that can carry more nuanced emotional messages to avoid misunderstandings and quickly resolve tensions. For example, if a Slack thread gets messy, drop a Zoom link in there and get people to switch to a video call. There's also the asynchronous version, record a Loom video and embed it into a Confluence page. Tone of voice and facial expressions can add a lot. Speaking of facial expressions, there's a feature I found to be surprisingly powerful in work collaboration tools, emoji reactions. I think it started off with the ability to like a post in Facebook, and now this feature is in many tools, allowing users to like a Confluence page, add a heart eyes face to a Trello card comment, or a not sure if fry face to a Slack message. Emoji reactions may seem frivolous, but I think they replace some important aspects of collaborating in real life that otherwise we lose online. In many ways, chat tools like Slack and Teams have become the remote worker's office. They're the place where people are. If I post a message to Slack and get no reply, it can feel like I'm being ignored or there's no one there. But sometimes a message doesn't need a written response. A reaction may be enough. In real life, a smile, a nod or a laugh gives you that response. Emoji reactions replicate those kinds of non-verbal micro interactions that are really important for human connection. Thirdly, how can tools help with time management and focus? Let's talk about notifications and scalability. Notifications are like a garden. They need occasional pruning or they'll just become an overwhelming mess. Most tools give you some ability to control what you're notified about. In Trello, you can watch or unwatch cards, lists and boards. In Confluence, you can watch or unwatch pages and whole spaces. In Atlas, you choose which tickets to follow. Prune those gardens. Then consider using a tool to help you manage notifications. A Trello board works well for this. Why not have a board of your own where you can paste links and notes, drag cards around to prioritize what needs your attention and track what you've dealt with to avoid things slipping through the cracks. If you keep getting asked the same question, consider answering in a more scalable way. For example, instead of answering via a private message in Slack, why not record a quick Loom video, post it in an open channel in Slack, and at mention the person who asked. Then your one-time effort can benefit many more people then and in the future. As perhaps a slightly over-the-top example, I was recently trying to explain something a bit tricky to various people over Slack and Confluence comments and was finding it hard to make myself understood. So I did what anyone would do. I borrowed my son's Star Wars Lego figures and made a quick Loom video, you know, using the Lego figures to represent different user types within Trello and illustrate the differences. I posted that quick video to Confluence and Slack, which has helped people to understand. And now it's there as a resource for the future with no more effort needed from me. Lastly, let's think about clarity and expectations. It's easy, especially when working remotely, for people to lack the clarity they need. We may need to be more intentional. Here are some ideas. You can clarify timescales by using due dates. On Trello cards, you can even add multiple custom date fields to set additional timescale expectations. Clarify the source of truth. When work is spread across multiple tools, Who's to know if the Trello card, Jira issue, Confluence page, Google Doc or Slack message has the most up-to-date, accurate information? I recommend making this explicit. For example, decide that the Confluence page will be the source of truth and state that when linking from other tools. So if there's conflicting information, people know which to trust. Clarify who's playing what role. There's an Atlassian playbook framework called a DACI that's great for defining roles when making decisions. In a DACI page, you list who's playing the role of driver, approver, contributor, and informed, so everyone is clear what's expected from them. Clarify what's changed. Many tools do a decent job of showing what's changed, 
but I find that humans can always do it better with a higher signal to noise ratio. What about adding a changelog table at the top of a confluence page or Google Doc with the date and a quick summary of what's changed since the last significant revision? If you've ever used source control tools like Git, it's the same idea as a commit message, and I found it valuable to help people keep up with changes. In fact, you can use Atlassian Atlas for the same thing, just at a whole team or project level. Thank you for sticking with me. Let's quickly recap what you've learned. Collaboration is first and foremost a people problem, but tools have a bi-directional interaction with people problems. Our mental model of axes helps evaluate tools and pick the right one for the work and life cycle moment. We need a hub to connect all the things, but not like this, like this. We thought about specific ways to connect and use tools to foster trust and teamwork, emotional communication, time and focus and clarity and expectations. All so that your team's collaboration can be more like this. Now, where's my bright red spandex costume? <laughs>